you know, the Congregate was a, a website that when we, when I was very, very focused on casual games and, and on downloadable games in particular, Congregate, which was founded by um, Emily and Jim Greer, um, was exploring and expanding the web game audience to include a really interesting cross-section of, of predominantly hardcore and what we have to some degree started calling the mid-core audience long before anybody else was doing that. And um, Congregate was sold to GameStop and, um, and then later introduced free-to-play games to that same audience and has been very successful. And today we have David Chu who heads up business development and developer relations for Congregate as well as business development um, for GameStop Digital Ventures uh, to talk about some of the learnings that they've had about uh, the way that players behave here in Asia versus in the West. So come on up on stage, David, and I'll turn it over to you to, uh, to educate us. All right, thank All you. Right, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm David Chu. I'm the Director of Developer Relations and Business Development for Congregate and also uh, GameStop Digital Ventures. Um, this presentation will examine um, free to play um, when it comes to Asian and Western approaches to, to them. And we'll uh, share best practices and also give specific examples of games and how they, um, what they do to retain, maximize retention and monetization. So this is based on a series of talks by uh, Emily Greer, Congregate's co-founder and CEO. So if you're into any of those talks before, the format will look familiar to you, although we have updated it with new content and um, some new, new uh, statistics as, as well. So first of all, a quick intro of what is Congregate. So it's a social gaming platform for uh, browser-based games. Uh, we're focusing on free-to-play games. We have over 50 million monthly unique visitors worldwide, uh, very much core gamers, 85% male, average age of 21, who are very much into um, MMOs, RPGs, collector card games, trading card games, tower defense game shooters, and so forth. We have a platform-level currency called Creds uh, for free-to-play games. Uh, we're also a mobile publisher of free-to-play games for core gamers, and we're also part of the GameStop family. Um, here are some of the better-known um, developers and publishers we work with. Um, and we work with developers of all shapes and sizes from all over the world, from small one to two man indie developers to big multinational corporations like you know, Nexon and Konami. So you know, when we talk about free to play games, statistic, the statistics that the industry usually focuses on are DAU, um, you know, dollar per DAU, one to seven day uh, retention, MAU 30 day retention. And 30-day retention is usually used to measure long-term retention in, in an industry, but 30 days is not really long-term in my opinion. Uh, it, it's just a start. So I'm gonna be sharing a lot of statistics with you guys, um, but I wanted to provide some definitions to, uh, so you understand what, uh, how we define certain things, so everyone defines it differently. So first of all, all stats are lifetime with a minimum of with all games being on the platform on Congregate for at least six weeks or more. Uh, ARPU is average revenue per user. RPP is average re revenue per paying user. A player is defined as a Congregate registered user who has loaded the game at least once. And this is important to define because uh, everyone defines a, a player usually uh, very differently. So, and usually it's like you know, re a registered player. Um, plays is number of sessions and this is how we measure retention as opposed to like D1, D7, D30 retention, we measure it by number of times they play because it does a much better job of capturing the intensity of the gameplay. Um, you know, one person can play a game twice in 30 days or 100 times, and you know, that, those are very different players that you want to measure differently. So, you know, th this is a, a graph of all the games on Congregate, and we're graphing the uh, ARPU on the y-axis and the RPPU on the bottom axis. So you can see there's a very big range um, in terms of how games monetize. Uh, the single player games tend to have lower monetization, of course. The RPPUs uh, for those games tend to be in the five to $10 range and you can see a little cluster there in the bottom. Um, mul multiplayer games, the RPPU ranges from $20 to $350. And you can see here that the ARPU ranges from, you know, zero to as much as uh, seven plus dollars. Uh, you, most of them fall within the you know, um, zero to three dollar range and there are a couple outliers here that are like you know, really kicking ass. 
Um, here we're graphing the ARPU and the percentage of spenders that are big buyers. Uh, big spenders, we define them as people who have spent $300 or more. As you can see here, there's a very clear correlation between having big spenders in your game and how well it monetizes. Um, and I should note that uh, we'll be, I'll be posting these uh, slides online. So I see a lot of people taking pictures and writing furiously. So don't worry, we'll share the slides. Um, so big spenders for the top games on Congregate, um, they account for more than 67% of revenue. And for all other games, it's slower, but still significant at 48%. And here we're graphing um, spending uh, with um, days since first play. So you can see that the red line for top games on Congregate, um, for they have a very, very linear um, spending pattern. You know, they keep users engaged uh, in the game playing and spending. Um, and then this is important to note because big spenders are not caught, they're created. You know, and that's why you, you want to keep players in the game, keep them engaged so they um, you know, have more opportunity to spend and play. Now let's look at uh, statistics comparing Asian and Western free-to-play games. So now it's the same graph as before, but we've color coded it to show uh, Western games in green, um, Asian games in brown, and what we call mixed games in purple. Mixed games being like a multicultural company, either Western, you know, sets up a development studio in Asia, or a vice versa, kind of combining the best of both worlds. Um, here you can see that you know, um, Asian games tend to have uh, higher RPPUs, you know, the average. RPPU for a Asian game is $181 compared to $54 for a, a Western a multiplayer game. And this is what I mentioned before. And only nine Western games have RPPUs above $100. The high RPPU games are uh, dominated by Asian games. So now we're looking at ARPU and percentage of buyers. You can see here that uh, the Asian games, the ones in brown, tend to have lower uh, conversion of players to payers, um, while uh, Western games convert at a much higher rate. See how the green ones are, uh, tend to be on the right. And now let's look at ARPU and percentage of repeats, which measures er early game retention, how many people come back to play the game at least twice. Um, and here you can see another clear pattern of Asian games tend to have much uh, slightly lower uh, initial retention. All the, the, the uh, brown um, bubbles tend to be on the left, while the green ones tend to be on the right. And now we're looking at percentage of people who play the game 50 times or more. Um, so length measures longer term retention, and you can see that the same pattern holds. Um, for Asian games because less people make it through the initial part of the game. You know, of course, less people are going to be in the, in the later part of the game. So you know, in summary, Asian games have higher RPPU but tighter player funnels, you know, and the monetization caters really well to, to big spenders. While Western games have lower RPPU but wider player funnels, you know, and monetization focuses on having good initial retention and high conversion rates uh, at lower prices. Um, and another thing to consider here is that for Western developers, you know, pay to win is not as accepted as it, it is in you know, Asia. So that's another factor that, that kind of shifts numbers around a bit. And then mixed games kind of combine the best of, of both, both worlds. You have high conversion, a wide funnel, and can still create uh, big spenders. And this chart is going to look really ugly um, because there's so many numbers here. But here we're looking at the uh, Western multiplayer games. And you can see the spending behavior uh, as people play more and more times. You know, going from one play to two to 10, 10 uh, 11 to 50, up to 500 plus game plays. And you can see that uh, the more people play, uh, the more likely they are to buy the, and the more they spend, uh, the more they transact and the more they spend per transaction. Um, and overall, uh, there's a very, you know, um, amount of big amount of spending that's been done by the players to get really deep into the game. 
Here you see more than 80% of re revenue being generated by 2% of players um, who you know, play the game 100 times or more. And then for uh, Asian multiplayer games, um, the numbers reflect what I had mentioned before, you know, tighter funnels but greater, uh, higher RPPUs. So even though less people make it uh, through the end of the game, they monetize better when they're deeper in the game. So you can see here that you know, the, the ARPU for a player that plays 500 times or more for a Western game is you know, $56 versus um, almost $200 for an Asian game. Now that you've seen all these numbers, you know, you're wondering, so what do some games do differently to have better retention or and better monetization than, than some other games? So in this next section, we're going to share best practices and give examples from games of how this, uh, this is done. Uh, we're going to start with optimizing retention, and then moving to optimizing monetization, and then player satisfaction, because all three go hand in hand. So keeping users engaged. First, um, daily play bonuses. Now we all know this can be a very useful tool to get people to come back and play the game regularly. And typically what we see is we have the five to seven day daily bonuses in which you get bigger rewards for, for playing the game up to seven days. Uh, but there are many ways to improve upon this basic formula. Here is an example from a game called Wartoon, which was a very big success in in China by Seven Road, and then was brought over to the West by R2 Games. And you see this in ma many Asian MMOs as well, um, in which every day you check in, you get a stamp for that day, and you unlock bigger and bigger rewards uh, the more days of the month you check in. You know, two, five, 10, up to 20, uh, 26 days. So it rewards people uh, over the longer term, doesn't reset up after five to seven days, and doesn't punish players for missing a day. Here's another example from a game called Card Monsters. Uh, I like this because they you know, make add an element of chance by turning it into a daily gift roulette. And you know, repeat logins unlock bigger and bigger rewards while the smaller rewards go away. So you know, you're incentivized to, to keep playing to unlock the bigger rewards. So don't punish people for taking a break. So you know, with free to play games, we want people to come back and play the game very uh, regularly. Um, uh, but the thing is, sometimes uh, people have to take breaks, and when you come back, um, you want to reward that behavior as opposed to punishing them. So, you know, psychologically speaking, uh, punishments deter unwanted behavior. So, if you stay away from a game too long, then you know, your, ca your base is raided. You lose all your resources, your loot, your crops with it, your troops die, and so forth. And this keeps players from being away too long. However, this can be a two-edged sword. Uh, players sometimes need to take a break. You know, they have exams, they work gets busy, they go on vacation, or get, they get sick. Uh, so punishment may drive reactivated users away from a game um, sometimes. For example, you know, if I was on vacation or you know, I was away for a week at Casual Connect you know, and didn't play the game, and if I come back and find my base completely destroyed, all my resources gone, you know, everything basically reset. You know, um, I feel like I'm being punished for having come back after a break, uh, but we want to, instead to encourage that type of behavior, um, reactivating lapsed players. So, and there are some ways to mitigate uh, the you know, sting of a punishment. So punishment should sting, but not permanently uh, handicap you. you know? Uh, limit the amount of resources um, that can be looted or the number of times it can be attacked while you're gone. And enable shield or protection time if you have been attacked a lot of times or lo lose a significant amount of your resources or base. And mix positive reinforcement with punishment. You know, uh, Clash of Clans does this very well in which you, know, you come back, you, your base might be destroyed, but with one button push, uh, everything goes back to normal, and you can still harvest the resources that accumulated while you're gone. And some games also have you gain XP and gold while you're away. So it's um, uh, when you come back, you feel like you're being rewarded because you have accumulated all this that you can redeem. Keep players busy. You know, the more things they have to do, the more players uh, end up staying. 
Again, a screenshot from Wartoon. This game has every possible type of gameplay mode imaginable. There's solo and team PvE, PvP, asynchronous raids, skill battles, war boss raids, and so f and on and on. But it's important to introduce new features um, and gameplay modes at a pace that's not intimidating or overwhelming to the players. You, know, um, you don't want to have a very long, boring tutorial and we're just throwing everything at them. If they're not going to be able to participate in guild battles until they're level 20, don't introduce guilds until level 20. And then with all this content and gameplay modes, it's important to have a very clear and visible uh, sense of progress so people can see and feel that they are making progress. And this makes a very good, uh, important uh, difference when it comes to long-term retention and monetization, as you can see here for multiplayer games with RPG elements. The R for multiplier is almost, uh, it's about 10x. Even for single player games, it's two, uh, 5x. Um, not all types of multiplayer are created equal. Asynchronous uh, beats out synchronous. Um, most top games on Congregate actually have both. But if you have to go with one, asynchronous is not only easier to do, but also retains monetizes better. And the reason for this is people like to play at their own pace. Um, you know, asynchronous requires people to be you know, online at the same time if they're playing with their friends, while asynchronous. You know, they can be online whenever they want to be. Now let's look at best practices for optimizing retention. You know, a happy customer is a paying customer. Shopping should be easy and frictionless. Here's a screenshot from a game in which uh, the players just couldn't find the store because it was floating somewhere up in the sky above your base, your base. And there's no reason for players to go there unless they knew there was a store there. <laughs> so uh, the developer actually had to tell people in chat and in the forums and the comment section where it was. So location, location, location. Make the store easy to find. And then uh, make it easy for them to find what they want to buy. Have meaningful categories and item descriptions. And no massive scroll bar so, so you know, it's easier for them to find what they want to buy. Mix soft currency and hard currency items so they're exposed to both at the same time. But don't try to sell too hard too fast. The first few sessions should be about having fun and giving players reason to come back, not on upselling. Buy screen, this is a very important screen in free-to-play games. Uh, when you sell currencies of hard packages, uh, hard packages of currency. So uh, it's important to call out uh, bonus percentages and items for buying larger packages uh, to incentivize players to do so. Clearly call out the percentages and do the math for the players so they don't have to do it themselves. Again, less friction, the less friction the better. Make all packages visible in one page and hide $100 plus packages until after the first purchase. You know, if you have $300 or $500 packages in, in the game, it might scare away some uh, new user. So you want to hide those or suppress those until after one or X, X amount of purchases. And here are a couple examples from games that uh, have a good layout and clearly call, call out uh, the, the bonuses for la buying large packages. Make the shopping experience interesting. So have very compelling first time uh, or starter packages in which you, you know, see them with hard currency, uh, also some items to get them over that first hump of buying your, your first item. Uh, because once they've opened their wallet, it's much easier to get them to, to do so again. Uh, see players with some hard currency and then walk them through a first purchase as part of the tutorial or the first time user experience. So they get a taste of the benefits of buying and then know the process once they, you know, once if they decide to, they want to buy. Uh, deals and events get people in the, into the habit of buying things regularly. Uh, offer items that are enhanced gameplay, not just speed ups. Um, introduce items at the right time. You know, don't introduce a, try to sell a level 100 plus sword to a level one player because they won't be able to use it. And, and then keep them coming back. Keep the content fresh, unlock new items as they level up, uh, and feature seasonal and time-limited items. Up here on the right, you can see that this is uh, from a game, Autonauts, in which they do a good job of having that timer that counts down to when the deal expires. So it creates that impulse to buy before it, it, the deal goes away. Another trend we see um, in uh, free-to-play games now, especially from Asia, is the gamification of buying. 
just like you see with airlines and hotels, the more you buy, the more status points you gain, and there's certain benefits that come along with that status. Uh, make sure players can spend as much as they want. Uh, the longer someone plays, the less, less price sensitive they become and the more they're willing to buy. Uh, committed players, um, you know, give them the ability to spend $1,000 or more if they want. Uh, have lots of items, especially for elder players, uh, that are priced higher if possible. Price higher means you know, $30 maybe to $100 or more, not $1,000. If you make a fun game, someone will want to spend uh, can spend a lot of money in it, you know, four figures, five figures, or more. And so don't crea create a situation in which you're capped by availability or utility. And again, remember to make it easier for them to buy. Uh, lastly, best practices for community building. So make it easy for a community to build. And we have a lot of tools that are baked into the Congregate platform, such as dedicated uh, chat rooms for multiplayer games, forums, and so forth. Um, allow people to create real relationships in this game. The more ways they do it, the better. You know, this is one of the reasons why games on Congregate tend to monetize a lot better on Congregate versus other platforms when they come over because we have a much more sticky user base and you know, higher quality core gamers, but also because there are real relationships between our players. And we usually see a 2 to 3x ARPU multiplier when games come over from Facebook and other platforms. Sometimes it could be a, as high as 5 to 10x ARPU. Uh, guilds are awesome. All uh, our top games have guilds in them. And guilds, um, guild members usually spend 10 to 20 times more than non-guild members. This doesn't mean that if you join a guild, you start spending 10 or 20 times more. Uh, it's, it's, there's a correlation, but it, it doesn't mean causation. Uh, and, but we do see spending go up when guilds are added, especially when they're competitive guilds. And there, some reasons for this is, you know, there's a sense of belonging. I belong to this group, that, um, they depend on me, so I, I need to play off and contribute. Um, and when I buy, I'm not just buying for myself, but I'm buying for the guild. And it also kind of changes the dynamics and upends um, pay to win. You know, if you have a spender, especially a big spender within your guild that can buy stuff for everyone, then you kind of stop complaining that the game's pay to win. Community service and community management and customer service very important with Western audience who tend to be more entitled than an Asian audience. So the more they, they play the game, they start to feel a sense of ownership. Now, it may be your game, but it is their experience. So you know, be visible in the forums, chat, and email, just like the last speaker said. You know, it, go, it goes a very long way. And also be fun. You know, show them that you're human. Uh, listen to their concerns, acknowledge their, emo their emotions. Doesn't mean that you have to agree, <laughs> just you know, let them know that they're being heard. Uh, be transparent, honest, and accurate, uh, especially with uh, you know, changes and downtime, so they have time to prepare or get excited. And obviously, don't feed the trolls. So opportunity knocks and also complaints. Use customer service as a uh, chance to surprise and delight. You know, if there are real issues, handle them quickly. And with virtual goods, you know, the, the cost of losing a player and the cost of issuing virtual items, you know, keeping a player is pretty priceless. So uh, you know, it's important to keep the players happy. So be generous compensation. But don't do something unless you're doing, willing to do it for everyone because players are going to talk amongst themselves. So be very clear internally of what you're willing and not willing to do and be consistent. And then this is an example from uh, a game called Galaxy Online in which they have 30 minute weekly maintenances uh, and then they give out some resources after each one, even though it's just 30 minutes, and, and people really love that. And then have fun with your community. So w this is an Asian MMO uh, that has uh, some very rough translations that um, this user pointed out as having very wonderful English uh, translations. And the developer replied with a very funny yet informative uh, response in which they um, you know, acknowledge the problem, let them know what's happening, and that it's something that they're working on. And, and players really appreciated that, and also that the fact that it's, well, it's a humorous response. So that's it. So you know, thank you very much for your time. If you want a copy of this presentation or have any questions, you can feel free to email me at davidshu at uh, gamestop.com. And we also have a booth in the silver sponsor room, uh, table number five. 
can visit our developer blog uh, for more data and talk. Uh, if you're interested in distributing your web games uh, on Congregate, uh, you can contact apps at congregate.com. And for mobile publishing, you can contact us at mobile at congregate.com. Thank you. Thank you, David.